finally touched down. At 12 a.m. ET on Saturday, the 9th of September, Boeing Starliner landed safely at White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico, ending 12 weeks in space. Despite what was deemed a safe re-entry, as we can see, propulsion issues on the Starliner continue to persist. So, should we consider this a successful landing of the vehicle? Find out everything in today's Tech Map episode. But before we begin, let's subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest space news. At 6.04 p.m. EDT on September 6th, Boeing's uncrewed Starliner spacecraft was undocked from the International Space Station. Engineers used Calypso's forward thrusters, avoiding the problematic thrusters that had previously malfunctioned. As a result, the undocking process went quite smoothly, except that as Starliner was backing away from the station, one of the thrusters did not fire as expected. In NASA's words, although this means a slight loss of redundancy, it shouldn't keep Starliner from getting through re-entry and landing as expected. About four hours after undocking, Mission Control confirmed Starliner had completed its deorbit burn and jettisoned its service module to burn up over the Pacific Ocean. Starliner's crew module, without its crew, continued to fly by itself, heading for a landing in New Mexico. To avoid any potential risk, the Starliner crew module uses a different set of thrusters from those that caused trouble during Starliner's flight. But another problem happened, as one of the 12 control thrusters on the crew module failed in a test earlier in the evening. A single thruster failure isn't expected to be an issue for entry. Luckily, at 12 a.m. ET on Saturday, Starliner landed at the White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico. NASA astronauts Barry Butch Wilmore and Sunita Suni Williams will remain on board the International Space Station as members of Expedition 7170 seconds before their return on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft no earlier than February 2025. Despite being deemed to be a safe landing, as we can see, there are still thruster problems that happen during the journey. NASA might have predicted these problems. Thus, Starliner's departure from the station was set to be different from what was originally planned when it would have astronauts on board. The spacecraft would make a relatively rapid departure from the vicinity of the station, called a breakout burn, rather than a more gradual separation that would include a fly-around of the station. This maneuver was designed to minimize stress on the thruster, particularly the aft-facing ones that had experienced problems in June. Once Starliner is away from the vicinity of the station, though, controllers plan to test fire several of the thrusters. NASA's Steve Stitch said engineers were still choosing what thrusters to test, but that they may involve some of the aft thrusters that experienced problems, including one that appeared to lose all thrust on approach to the station and did not recover in subsequent tests. Those tests would be short pulses, lasting about 0.1 seconds, which would be enough to see how well they were forming. The purpose of that is to continue to learn, he said, collecting data in addition to test perform while Starliner was docked to the station. We really want to see how the thrusters perform and what the thrust levels exactly are after we undock and fire them for a little bit. This comes from the failure to understand the root cause of the spacecraft issues, even though previously both NASA and Boeing spent weeks testing and analysis. These stretched Williams and Wilmore's stay from the expected length of about eight days to months. And even if the problems were understood, that didn't mean things would get much easier. The Starliner team would never get to inspect the propulsion system on the actual vehicle in space. It was impossible to survey the problem as the Starliner sat attached to the space station. More terribly, the service module, which houses the troubled RCS thrusters and the helium leaks, was not intended to survive the trip home. Instead, it was jettisoned and burned up upon re-entry following Starliner's deorbit burn. This explains why they have to keep the spacecraft in space longer to get access to the existing service module. Unfortunately, hard work doesn't pay off. The ambiguity surrounding what exactly happened to the service module's components was one key factor in NASA's decision to fly the vehicle home without its crew. During its perilous return to Earth, Starliner does have other types of thrusters meant to help the vehicle keep its orientation as it travels through space. The RCS thrusters were used again to maintain attitude control during the deorbit burn, which was carried out by larger thrusters. The RCS thrusters maneuvered the spacecraft after that burn to separate the crew capsule from the service module and orient the capsule for re-entry. Alongside the 28 RCS thrusters are 20 Orbital Maneuvering and Attitude Control, or OMAC, thrusters, each of which has about 17 times the thrust of an RCS thruster. But what if helium starts to leak in that case? NASA's Stitch described how the problems already identified on the Starliner's service module might combine to create a disaster scenario. 
The worst case would be some integrated failure mechanism between the helium leaks and the RCS thruster, he said. For a nominal deorbit burn, we fire 10 OMAC thrusters in each of the four doghouse, and then the RCS jets are just there to hold the orientation. He added that if OMAC thrusters began failing because of helium leak, a bleak outcome could arise. Then you could end up with some cases that aren't easily controlled. And that's really the more stressing cases that the team is worried about. With Starliner safely back on Earth, NASA will now turn its attention to certifying the vehicle for crew rotation mission. It includes addressing the thruster problems as well as helium leaks. We've been entirely focused this summer on understanding what is happening on orbit, trying to decide if we could bring the crew back or not, Stitch said. What we need to do now is really lay out the overall plan, which we have not had time to do. At the pre-return briefing, NASA did not indicate how long post-flight reviews of Starliner and corrective actions might take, or if Boeing would be required to perform another test flight before certification. To be certified for the first of six operational crewed missions, Calypso must be reliable first. Any issues with its propulsion system and even other components have to be thoroughly addressed. But that will be difficult for a contractor known for a decade of persistent technical problems and a flawed operating system. Of course, they really need a major overhaul. And of course, no one knows how long that will take. This is something NASA is concerned about, and the national agency has yet to decide whether to require Boeing to conduct another test flight to ensure safety before officially certifying Starliner for operational missions. Any answer that involves a yes or no comes down to a trade-off between safety and time. Aside from the decision on another test flight to receive full contract money, Boeing has to complete six missions under the contract. However, only three of the six missions are currently confirmed to be ordered. Theoretically, NASA awards these task orders about two to three years prior to a mission's launch. As a result, Boeing can only complete a maximum of three missions in six years before the ISS retires in 2030. On the other hand, if the space agency allows Boeing to prepare for any Starliner missions beyond the three already on the books, this would conflict with NASA's current plan, as SpaceX intends to bring online a new fifth crew dragon for its fleet next year. The U.S. Space Agency intends to order more Dragon missions, along with 14 extended missions of SpaceX's commercial crew contract. So they just need the handful of Starliner flights already on order, which is enough to keep the ISS fully staffed through 2030. Anyway, Calypso's safe return is still a blessing for Boeing itself. Thanks to that, the company will have more evidence to persuade NASA engineers that Starliner is good to go for crew rotation flights once Boeing resolves the thruster problems and helium leaks. Continuing the Starliner program could help Boeing earn $1.9 billion in potential revenue from NASA. Of course, that $1.9 billion is of the $4.6 billion total potential value of its commercial crew contract. As you may know, NASA awarded the company an initial $4.2 billion contract in 2014, and contract modifications since 2014 have added $400 million to the deal. So far, $2.7 billion has been paid out, while $1.9 billion remains to cover future service payments for operating flights. The $1.9 billion figure is still more than the $1.6 billion in losses the company has incurred on the program to date. Two NASA astronauts, Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore, who traveled to the International Space Station in a eight-day mission, now end up staying there for over eight months because of problems with the Boeing Starliner spacecraft. To add insult to injury, NASA announced that the crew will return on Boeing's rival SpaceX in February 2025. This further cemented in the public mind that Starliner had indeed failed a crucial mission that, if successful, would have certified the Boeing-built spacecraft as capable of carrying humans. By contrast, if fails, Boeing will likely conduct one more crewed test flight that could cost the company additional $400 million. Subsequently, their first operational mission would then be further delayed, and the $1.6 billion loss figure would continue to rise threatening to cancel the whole program. It explains why, while NASA's leadership was a headache in weighing the risks to safely return astronauts and Starliner, the Boeing engineer continuously called for permission for Starliner to bring humans back. Of course, with the bitter lessons gained from the space shuttle's era, NASA acknowledged that they should strictly follow their core value, human safety. Frankly, I think they should have done it before putting Sunni and Butch into the Calypso in June. Simultaneously, through this event, Boeing's cold-blooded nature has been demonstrated obviously much more than ever. They focused only on the company's stock price after the Starliner incident instead of the safety of the crew.
Thus, it would not be unfathomable as Boeing's manager continuously tried to downplay the trouble, even though the reality was completely opposite. Rudy Ridolfi, a former commander of U.S. military space systems, has pointed out the horrific scenarios if astronauts were forced to return to Earth in the troubled Calypso. Scenario 1, 96-hour oxygen supply. The malfunction in the thruster system poses a threat to Butch and Sunni aboard their vehicle, with 5 out of 28 thrusters being faulty throughout their journey to the ISS. The failed thrusters leave astronauts with a 96-hour oxygen supply. Keep in mind that thrusters are important to maneuvering and re-entry to Earth. Scenario will happen if the spacecraft tries to re-enter Earth's surface through the wrong angle which will ultimately result in bouncing off the atmosphere. This leads us to the second scenario. The spacecraft could bounce off the Earth's atmosphere as it will fail to line up for re-entry. Service module could fail ahead of the lineup for re-entry. The move will cause the spacecraft to bounce off the Earth's atmosphere. In the worst case scenario, the astronauts will get vaporized to death in space. According to Ridolfi, it is possible only if the angle is too steep, leading to an increase in friction leading to the burning up of Starliner, potentially killing off the two astronauts on board. In the past, NASA also lost a total of 14 astronauts in two Columbia and Challenger disasters. Bill Nelson's experiences with the Challenger and Columbia disasters significantly shaped his perspectives and decisions regarding space exploration and safety, particularly in the context of the Butch and Sunni case. And of course, politics has not played any part in the decision, he said. It has affected the decision today by this collective group and all of those that participated in the flight test readiness review this morning, Nelson and said at a press conference on August 24th. It is trying to turn around the culture that first led to the loss of Challenger and then led to the loss of Columbia, where obvious mistakes were not being brought forth. NASA administrator, who was an astronaut aboard the space shuttle Columbia just 10 days before the Challenger disaster, expressed profound personal reflections on the tragedy. On January 28, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into its flight, killing all seven crew members aboard. Witnessing the Challenger exploded shortly after launch was a traumatic event that altered public perception of space travel, transforming it from a routine endeavor into a stark reminder of the risks involved. Nelson recalled dropping to his knees in his office, questioning why he had been spared from a similar fate. The Challenger disaster led to a critical reassessment of NASA's safety protocols, revealing a culture that had become complacent about mission risks. This reckoning prompted Nelson to advocate for stronger safety measures and oversight within NASA, emphasizing the importance of maintaining rigorous safety standards in future missions. On Saturday, February 1, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it re-entered the atmosphere over Texas and Louisiana, killing all seven astronauts on board. That was determined to be caused by a large piece of foam falling from the shuttle's external tank during launch, damaging the orbiter's wing. Nelson noted how engineers who raised concerns over components and launching in very cold weather were ignored ahead of the Challenger launch. For Columbia, several people within NASA pushed to obtain pictures of the damaged wing in orbit, but re-entry proceeded without further inspection. So NASA, ever since, has tried very hard to bring about an atmosphere in which people are encouraged to step forward and speak their mind. And I think, right, today is a good example of that, Nelson said. As a decision maker, it can be said that the burden on Nelson's shoulders is enormous. Wayne Hale former space shuttle program manager and flight director for 40 missions, shares frankly about this in his blog. These are decisions that do not affect some faceless, nameless, random human. Rather, these decisions will affect the safety of people that you know. At the very least, these are people we have worked together with, trained together, spent hours in difficult meetings together. Astronauts have lives like most of us. We send our children to school with their children. Those children participate in the same after-school programs. Sports, music, scouts. Your spouse and their spouse worked, partied, socialized together. I've had to make decisions about the safety of astronauts who were literally my neighbors, some who attended the same church my family does, knowing that you will have to look the spouses and the children in the eye after whatever happens. Well, that does not make deciding any easier. Clearly, it's not the first time NASA has come up with the idea of a rescue mission. There was actually an exercise done to work this out at the direction of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board CAIB. It comes from the pain caused by the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. NASA could have tried to launch Space Shuttle Atlantis on a rescue mission if they had known Columbia was going to disintegrate on re-entry. Yet, how would they have gotten the astronauts down? 
While Columbia was on orbit, Atlantis was undergoing preparations for a March 1st launch as STS-114. It would have been possible, albeit a difficult and demanding race against time, to launch Atlantis on a rescue mission. Columbia would have faced a 30-day mission limit, determined by its supply of lithium hydroxide scrubbers used to remove CO2 from the cabin atmosphere, and additional limits posed by food, water, and power supplies. Depending on when the decision was made to launch a rescue, Atlantis could have rendezvoused with Columbia as early as Mission Day 27, with the launch prep and flight crews working a brutal 24 7 schedule and no room for error or delays, but it was at least feasible. In the CAIB's scenario, Atlantis would have launched with a four-person crew of two pilots and two mission specialists to conduct the EVAs. Meanwhile, Columbia's crew would have powered down the orbiter and adopted a max conservation routine, essentially staying in their bunks as much as possible to conserve oxygen and minimize CO2. Once Atlantis rendezvoused with Columbia, the two EVA astronauts would have connected the orbiters with an extendable boom. They would transfer two EVA suits to Columbia, meeting two already suited Columbia astronauts and helping them transfer to Atlantis. The remaining astronauts would relay the EVA suits back and forth in a grueling eight, nine hour spacewalk. Finally, the last two crewmen would have set up Columbia for control from Houston. Atlantis would back away and prepare for re-entry. Columbia would be set up for deorbit and a final fiery re-entry, presumably to Point Nemo in the South Pacific, the most remote spot on Earth and where the majority of controlled deorbitings are targeted. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.